Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, today we want to talk about privacytools.io adding Ubuntu to the recommended operating system list and why is this a little bit odd and maybe a little bit contrary to their mission. Let's discuss that. So greetings and welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, I like privacytools.io. I thought when the start page situation occurred, they handled things really well. There were some questions they could not get answered. So they pulled start page off the recommended list. They went through, continued to work with the company, and then they eventually added start page back to the recommended search, his, uh, search engine list. Because StartPage had provided a lot of information, there was more context that was out there. StartPage, uh, even now, I mean, I'm trusting StartPage a lot right now. Uh, I would definitely trust it because I've seen how they're doing things. I've seen what their actual connection is with System 1, and it's not particularly concerning. And I really love following the discussion that the IO, uh, the privacy tools that IO team went through. They had discussions. Everything was searchable. You could find everything. There was discussions in, in various forums and things like this. And I thought that that was really good. And still to this day, they have a lot of really good recommendations on there. But what has me interestingly concerned is this weird shift to throw Ubuntu up on the list. And it makes me wonder, speculatively, is there something else going on behind the scenes? So somebody asked me to look into this and I reached out to them for some comment. I'll read you what their comments were in a moment. But somewhere after June, uh, so in the June 10th snapshot on Internet Archive still lists Debian, Fedora, and uh, Cubes as the recommended operating systems. Now sometime after that period of time, they broke this down into introductory operating systems and advanced operating systems and uh, some Tor-focused operating systems for the desktop. There's other ones I'm not getting into mobile here. Well, what they did is under uh, introductory operating systems, now they have Fedora and Ubuntu listed. I went to see if I could find any comment and discussion as to when and why Ubuntu was added. And uh, so I reached out and I got an interesting answer that had absolutely 100% nothing to do with privacy. They gave me four reasons in the email. They said the main reason it was added is one, it has a good security record. Prompt patches to CVEs. Number two, decent QA, quality assurance, on release, and hardware vendor support. Number three, six month release cycles are nicer for desktop use than Debian stable release cycles. And number four, generally more polished for desktop users and new users. Is this all true or not? That's an interesting question because all of these seem to be user experience and security. Now, security is important, but security and privacy are two different things. Privacy is an operating system preventing any form of data collection upon you to see and determine how a person is being used or even to determine if the service is being used. I will include that under privacy. Security is how clean does the system keep from intrusions. Two completely different things. So we have all of these here. A good security record. This is security, not privacy. Decent QA, that's actually debatable. Ever since uh, like 1604 was the last really good release of Ubuntu that wasn't a dumpster fire on release, uh, at least as far as the, as the LTS cycles. Six month release cycle, nicer for desktop use than Debian stable release cycles. Okay, I will agree with that when comparing to Debian, but there's other distributions that do a better job. Generally more polished for desktop users and new users. I'm gonna disagree with that last statement as well. I think if you're going to use these methods as your approach, Mint fits this better than Ubuntu does. Okay, in fact, Mint has more cycles. They have the annual cycle, but then there's four different point releases within that yearly cycle. It is way more polished for new, new users and desktop users, way more, because the, the um, 
system, the, the desktop environment that Ubuntu uses is unfamiliar to a lot of people. GNOME is not a particularly user-friendly and intuitive system. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it's not intuitive for new users, whereas Mint does. Decent QA, I think that Mint does as good of a job, if not better, than um, than Ubuntu, primarily because they release it when it's ready, not when the calendar says it's time to release. And then it doesn't have a good security record. It does. Now, what's the concern with Ubuntu? Well, the concern with Ubuntu is actually has to do with the fact that there is actually some type of data collection out there, albeit it's not necessarily linking to you. But we find, um, remember when the, the Linux Mint and Ubuntu snap fight was going on when Linux Mint was released, and then Ubuntu comes out and says, hey, look at all these Linux Mint users that are using snaps. Well, Linux Mint doesn't collect data. In fact, they, they overwhelmingly in their system say, we do not do anything to collect data. We do not want your data. It's not part of our model. Ubuntu does. When you first install Ubuntu, it wants to send a snapshot of your systems. Like, oh, well, this is just system information. Yes, it's called a fingerprint. And it can be used to identify you. And that's a problem. Even if you say, don't send the information, it still pings the server. Now, Ubuntu says that, yes, it'll have to ping the server and grab the IP address when it pings, but then it'll drop the table. The IP address was still transmitted and it is still in that table before it is dropped. And that means if there is somebody who has compromised their servers, they can gain your information. So hopefully their security is good because there is a small privacy hole in what they are doing. Now, of course, we talked about in a separate video before about how they Ubuntu removed Popcon, which made sense because it was installed by default, but it was never enabled by default. They never made a big deal about it. Popcon is a Debian application that will determine, it, it'll look through your system and once a week it sends a, it focuses via cron job and it collects a list of all the applications and in what order you have used them. In other words, trying to determine which applications do you use the most and then sends this up to the server. Debian asks if you want that installed by default. Ubuntu always installed it by default, but it was always disabled. There was a period of time they would ask you to enable it, but they kind of dropped that and it sat there as a, um, as a vestigial package that was just kind of there and never really used. So what Ubuntu did in the recent versions is they got rid of it and they're like, hey, see, we don't even care about that anymore. <laughs> well, that's actually not true because what they do care about is remember that Ubuntu does force going into snaps as a priority. Are you forced on snaps? The answer is no, but they make it easier and more convenient to use snaps to steer people towards the direction of using snaps. But it turns out that snaps, the reason they want to do that and the reason Popcom was not important is because snaps collect data. This is from the Snap Store metrics from snapcraft.io. The Snap Store web UI can be used to track installation and usage statistics for snaps published with your developer account. In other words, it's information gathered to let the developers know that their packages are being installed. To accomplish this, the store assigns an anonymous identifier, the device serial, to every new SnapD client it sees. The exchange usually happens when a new installation contacts the store and the identifier persists for the lifespan of the machine. In other words, if somebody can compromise your real hardware and extract that identifier, you can be de-anonymized because of the Snap Store. Systems running SnapD will periodically make a fresh request to the store, checking the most recent release of each installed Snap. At that moment, they inform the store of their device serial along with a list of currently installed Snaps. The store simply infers the list of active applications from the client's requests in a given period. In other words, if it's there, it assumes you're probably using it, but that may or may not be accurate. All web UI metrics, plus a few additional ones, and I couldn't find any information on those additional ones, are available in the Store Metrics API. This can be used by developers and ISVs to easily integrate Snap Store data into any internal dashboards. To access the Snap Store, snapcraft.io slash store, log in with your developer account credentials, see using the Snap Store if you don't have an account. So in other words, there is data that's being collected. Since they're trying to push the snaps first, every instance of an operating system running 
Snapcraft, which is a proprietary store. The snaps are open source, but the store is proprietary. All of this pings together and the identifier for the device is persistent. This means that yes, they are collecting data, that yes, it's possible, albeit unlikely, possible to de-anonymize. But if you go back and look at several other operating systems that are like, oh, we don't care what you're doing, way more private. Ubuntu is one of the least private Linux distributions. Now, it's not nearly as bad as Windows. It's not nearly as bad as Apple. Those two there, like Apple, you can easily turn everything off. Windows, you can't turn everything off. It's just impossible unless you're using a, a pro uh, edition. Even then, it becomes more difficult. But Linux itself, even Ubuntu, it is still way better than Windows 10. Still way better than Apple. But it still is collecting data. It's still tying in sources. It's still harvesting data and sending data around. So why privacytools.io would add Ubuntu to the list forsaking thousands of other Linux distributions that are probably a lot better is a very shady thing. But they should also have a notice about snaps because snaps themselves, as we've seen from Snapcraft's own website once again, that they are indeed collecting information. So that is why it makes no sense that privacytools.io, which looked at start page under a magnifying glass, silently adds Ubuntu with apparently no discussion. And when asked about it, they only gave me security related things, not privacy related things. Guys, this is why I like Linux Mint. It is more intuitive. It is more private. They explicitly do not collect or want your information. There's several other Linux distributions, nearly everything in Arch. They don't collect or want your information. Everything in Debian, they don't want or collect your information unless you explicitly opt in with Popcon. These are some interesting questions and it makes me wonder, is there something else going on here that we're not seeing? Those are my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.